Every meal has a story to tell. That is, if you're willing to look for it. I'm Danielle Pruitt, and I started Wild and Whole with the mission to reawaken our connection to food and to empower us to develop meaningful relationships with the ingredients on our plate. You're not just farming sustainably, you're regenerating. As a cook, I'm driven by curiosity, and my inspiration springs from harvesting ingredients directly from its source. I've spent the past decade of my life trying to eat consciously, and believe me, it's not always easy. But it's taught me the value of our food and resources. And of course, it brings me so much joy in the kitchen. I want to challenge your perception of what food is, where it comes from, and how those two elements are woven into our lives. Because connecting to our landscape through food means so much more than just the calories that sustain us. Welcome to Wild and Whole Sourced. The industrialized commodity system that feeds most of this nation was designed to make food cheap, abundant, and safe. And it was wildly successful. It made food obscenely cheap, wastefully abundant, and boringly consistent. So one could say we got what we wanted. But the unintended consequences of that fell on the backs of the welfare of the animals, the degradation of the land and water, the impoverishment of rural America, and of course, climate change. This is why I stopped buying factory farmed meat from grocery stores nearly eight years ago and instead decided to hunt for protein. I wanted to connect to my food and know I was taking responsibility for my meat consumption. And while that has been rewarding, I'm realizing the need to support farmers who share a common goal in regenerating our environment for the sake of our wildlife. So I'm looking to expand my diet. I'm headed to Bluffton, Georgia to visit White Oak Pastures. White Oak Pastures is a sixth generation family farm in Southern Georgia, whose mission is to farm with zero waste. They find innovative ways to use all parts from the 10 species of livestock and poultry pasture raised on the property. They make biodiesel, compost, candles, leather goods, pet products, and sell these items in addition to all the different cuts of meat nationwide. I'm going to meet the farm owner, Will Harris, to learn more about how he uses the natural rhythms of nature to improve the land and sequester carbon. My entire mission in life and why I started Wild and Whole was that I wanted people to really care about what they're eating and where it came from. I used to be a little bit against the meat industry and the beef industry, and then I, I heard about regenerative ag and thought, like this is something new, this is different, something I can get behind. So I'm super excited to be here. This is a little bit like a dream come true. Well, thank you for coming. This this ranch, this farm is uh, our family farm. I'm the fourth generation, my daughters are the fifth generation and their babies are the sixth. The way we farm now is much more like my great grandfather and grandfather farm than it is like the industrial, commoditized, centralized farm that my dad and I ran for many years. When you say industrial, you mean like the conventional way, Mm -hmm. which is? Confinement, feeding of of grain to ruminants, cattle, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of chemical fertilizer, a lot of pesticides, a lot of sub-therapeutic antibiotics for the animals, a lot of hormone implants. We started in the mid-90s moving away from that model so you don't well, do any of those? I don't. No, not even antibiotics? Uh, we will give a sick animal antibiotic when it okay. comes out of our program as far as the, the meat getting. Okay. There's a lot of people claiming to be regenerative ag farmers, but really, like, what is that definition? What is regenerative ag? It is quite simply restarting the cycles of nature. I don't know how it could be defined as anything else. You know, the industrial commodity system has broken the cycles of nature. And when we restart those cycles, the land yields an abundance. Regenerative agriculture describes farming and grazing practices that, among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded land, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. There is 
an incredible amount of carbon sequestering capacity in a well-managed pasture. Every bit of carbon that my cow will bring in used to be greenhouse gas. And it was all brought down through photosynthesis and turned into that plant tissue. And that plant is, is just like a pump, pulling in greenhouse gases, putting some of it into this earth. Cows bite it off, it starts to slough off. We've shown that we actually uh, sequester yeah. three and a half pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent for every pound of grass-fed beef that we produce. And the battle to protect the future of meat and sustainability, limiting the environmental impact is key. And as an outdoors woman, I see how this practice improves the biodiversity of plants, pollinators, and wildlife, creating a healthy ecosystem for the game and fish we pursue. I'm so excited to cook with your beef because I'm sure it's gonna be amazing. But before I do, I feel like I have to earn it. Spending a day out here working on the farm and getting a better understanding of the operation. We'll work you like a rated mule. <laughs> The Harris family prayer has always been, we pray for plenty of good hard work to do and the strength to do it. Today I'm starting my day by joining Cole Scoggin, the hog manager. Hogs have been an important historical contributor to the dining table in Georgia for centuries. Hogs were traditionally raised in the woods as they are the ultimate forest creature. The white oak pasture hogs breed, gestate, farrow, and live under the farm's shade trees. They eat what they find as they forage, plus peanuts that they give them, and cracked eggs from their pasture-raised hens. They're also supplemented with non-GMO feed. What type of pig is it? Oh, well, this is the Iberian breed. Oh, it is? Yes. These were shipped from Spain back in 2014. I call them the Wagyu yeah. of pork. They're really marbly. Yeah. Yes, very flavorful. And so their piglets just sort of hang out over there while they eat? Yep, yep. The so piglets don't even, are they still drinking milk? They are still drinking milk for the first two weeks. So these piglets out here are under two weeks old. Oh my gosh. So. How old is this one? So that is about 24 hours. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. They're so scared. My main goal when I took over the department was to bring the stress level down yeah. as much as possible. These little pigs are born in these huts and they'll eventually move with the rest of the herd where they're rotationally grazed in pastures and trees. They're exposed to sunshine and are able to forage, run, jump, and root in the soil. I kind of want to wallow in that mud with them. <laughs> the sun's coming up. Day, you know. The sun is coming up. It's getting warm. As much as I'd love to hang out and roll in the mud with these pigs, there's much more to see. cattle business for 150 years here. Mm -hmm. The other hogs, sheep, goats are more recent. Mm -hmm. So this is our biggest enterprise. This is Scott Cleveland. Scott runs it. Uh, there's 996 mamas in here along with not including their calves and about 55 breed bulls. This is our biggest herd of cattle on the farm. They move every single day. Uh, so I'm, I move five herds every day. Oh my gosh. Wait, every herd moves every day? Yes, ma'am. So you do, Unless... do this process five times a day? Oh wow. All right, what is my job? So when we open the gate, you'll take one side and pull it open, and I'll pull the other one, then I'll walk back through the herd. Okay. In the past, large herds of ruminants like bison moved over the grasslands in search of fresh grass and to avoid predators. 
These herds grazed, defecated, stomped, and salivated as they moved into fresh areas, and they wouldn't return until they're fully recovered. White Oak Pastures uses grazing methods that mimic nature by rotating large herds of cows to fresh pastures every day. These patterns of high animal impact followed by a period of rest help to build a microbial rich soil, deepen plant roots, and prevent erosion. All key elements in regenerative agriculture. When I open those gates, like just like seeing hundreds of cows behind me, like just running out, that was uh, that was exhilarating. I love this job. There's no other place I want to be. You telling me you can get that view from an office chair? No. I don't think so. No. We do all our slaughtering here on the farm, uh, both uh, red meat animals and poultry. Mm -hmm. We generate about nine tons a day of uh, packing plant waste. We don't, we don't think of it as waste. We think of it as a nutrient stream. Mm -hmm. And we take uh, that material and compost it, and then we spread it back out here. So there's a, a lot of nutrient streams coming here, which allows us to accelerate the regeneration a lot faster. I'd like to check out the composting. Let's, let's go do that. Emily, I hear you are the compost queen. Uh, tell me a little bit about what's going on. I definitely smell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you get a little used to that after a while. So this is our compost field. We get a delivery from the plant every single day of things that they can't use or sell. Oh and that gosh. gets added to our compost pile. And it gets mixed with chicken litter and some sort of carbon material. So right now we're using wood chips. Okay. And then our compost sits for about two years before we put it back on the field. Two years. And that time just allows that microbial activity and all the good bacteria to just grow. So cool. Ooh. All right. Well, how do we get started? Follow me. This is our finished compost. And as you said, when we walked over here, like you can kind of smell that it, it's not the greatest smelling place on the farm. Yeah. But if you give this a whiff, it's far more earthy. Oh, yeah, it just smells like good soil. Exactly. So this is what our finished product would look like. So you're going from visceral waste from an animal to this beautiful stuff. And Mr. Will always talks about thinking generationally. Yeah. Uh, and that's definitely something that's very prevalent in the regenerative ag space is we're not just thinking about the next cow that we get to kill that's going to be on our plate or anything like that. We're thinking about any children that I could have and those children and my nieces and all of that kind of stuff. That's what goes in our decision. Watching Emily load up the organic compost to spread out on the fields, I am impressed with the effort White Oak Pastures is putting into restarting the cycles of nature. These animals are born here. They spend their lives roaming and grazing. They're humanely processed on site. Their remains are composted and then they're spread back out into the fields that they originally grazed on. To operate this vertically integrated zero waste model takes over 170 people. They work together to accomplish a common goal, taking care of the land and their livestock. <laughs> I want to make a meal for the Harris family using skirt and flank steaks, lesser known cuts that are extremely flavorful but not everyone knows how to work with them. So I'm going to visit Brian, the head butcher at White Oak Pastures. I take a lot of pride and enjoyment processing the wild game that I hunt, and I can't wait to help butcher a cow for our dinner. I love flank and skirt steak because I'm from Texas. It's, a, it's an integral part of Tex-Mex cooking. We do a lot of that fajita style flash seared meats. And I really wanted to use that in wild game, but the connective tissue so hard that you have to get every little bit of that off in order for it to work and then you're left with a really small piece. Yep. Um, so I think that's like what makes something this big special. So how do you go from here to like what's the next step? You start from the bottom? Yep, so what we'll do is leave okay. this carcass hanging on that rail until we pretty much get every piece off of that hook that's but holding that back Do I cut it? Yeah! Okay. Thank you. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start here. I don't, I feel like I don't want 
You're good. You're good. I'm probably too slow to be working. You're going to pass By Friday, we'll be, you'll be rock and rolling. There we go. Rock, right, we're going peace. We'll go straight down. Yep. That's good. I appreciate being in here and learning from you, like exactly like how the pros do it, because I'm just kind of the at-home person, and, uh, and so I appreciate you helping me break down some of the meat for cooking tomorrow. Very good. So, thank Very you well. so much. Thank you. Enjoy. So I had a ton of fun with Brian in the butcher room because I do like to butcher my deer. I have a lot of fun and I take a lot of pride in it. So I chose to cook tonight with skirt steak. Is that something you cook with often? It's <clears throat> something I eat often. Something you eat yeah, often? I don't cook anything often. <laughs> I think skirt steaks are really cool because you know they used to be thought of as a throwaway cut of beef. Being from Texas, the Mexican vaqueros received this as pay because it wouldn't sell at market. So where I'm from, it's something that's kind of celebrated. And mm -hmm. So I'm not going to marinate it. I'm a really simple salt and pepper girl. Good. Are you okay with that? I am. You can help me here. Grab a good pinch and we'll just sprinkle it over the meat. Yeah. And give it a good pepper crack. So I'm gonna flip them over and do the other side. How do you feel about pepper? Oh, I don't like pepper. Is there anything you don't like? Uh, vegetables. <laughs> vegetables? Yeah. I, I do have a salad on the menu. Yeah, I, I won't judge you if you decide not to eat it. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. Help yourself. You're gonna take a, take a snack? Yeah. Well, cut mm -hmm. me off a slice. Mm -hmm. How do you do my snack? I don't think I've ever eaten raw meat in the middle of prep. This is a treat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I like it. I got chip. That's actually very, yeah, very yeah, good. Food, it? Yeah, it's seasoned perfectly. Mm -hmm. well, that was actually super tender. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something I don't do every day. Oh, are you okay if we cook the rest? Yeah. You know what I do for a living, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these are seasoned. I'm gonna move on to the next portion. Yeah. I wanna make strawberry shortcakes for desserts. This is a biscuit recipe, <clears throat> really. We're gonna make these biscuits using the lard instead of any butter. And mm. lard, it has a little bit of that savory quality and it's a, it's a little bit less like a biscuit and a little bit more like a sweetened scone. And we're gonna put a lot of strawberries because I saw I saw y'all have a lot of strawberries mm. out at the farm. We start by cutting the chilled lard into the mixture of flour, baking soda, baking powder, and salt. The goal is to separate that lard into little bitty crumbles with your fingers. And so that way when it bakes, it gets all those little flaky layers. Mm. We're gonna stir this milk and cream into it. All right, just enough until it starts to form sort of a ball here. And then this is the fun part. Make a huge mess and then just turn it out onto the surface. I uh, sort of smash it out flat and then give it a really good coating of some more flour. And then I'm gonna do a little bit of folding so that I create some little layers. And that'll help it to rise and also be a little bit flaky. Here, it's your turn to fold. So just flip it under, then fold. Perfect. And now just smash it flat. Because I want these biscuits to be tender and rise really tall, we're careful not to overwork the dough. I'm actually going to scoot them really close together, and this helps them to rise up a little bit. And they're done. Okay. So we can put these in the oven and they take about 13 minutes to cook. All right, the biscuits can come out Good. of the oven and we'll put them here. Look at that. Woo! Look how perfect these are. So now we're gonna make the strawberry compote. We're just gonna cut up these strawberries, 
put it in a pot with a little sugar, a little red wine, and let it boil, and uh, that's it. Yeah. Pretty easy. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. I'm just gonna turn it up to like medium high just to kind of get the heat going, and then once it really starts boiling, we'll reduce the heat. And then we're gonna add a little bit of sugar. This is what's gonna give it not just sweetness, but whenever it heats and caramelizes, it gets sort of that jam-like texture. This is gonna be really hot. All right, so I'm gonna let that start to cool down, and then I'm gonna add this in just a minute. This is just a blend of cornstarch and water, and that's gonna help to thicken the consistency. And that's basically done. We can let it set and cool. And if you want, we can go ahead and have a biscuit, strawberry shortcake if, uh, if you want. Totally. Before the family arrives, <laughs> cheating. Yeah. <laughs> to plate this dish, we layer the warm strawberry compote onto the biscuit, then top with vanilla whipped cream, fresh strawberries, and a touch of powdered sugar. All right, All right let's dig in. Mmm. Good? Mm, good. Mmm. Really good. Oh, I could eat this for mm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Not so sweet. It's good. Yeah, it's not overly sweet. Mm. The fact that there's lard in the yeah, biscuits. There's a little savory in there. Yeah, it kind of helps to counterbalance mm -hmm. it. I'm not really big on sweets, but this is very, very good. Mmm. I am really happy to hear that. Oh, that's great. I'm really excited to have the rest of your family out so I can meet them mm. and sort of celebrate everything y'all created. Mm. Put all the breakable stuff in the pack. <laughs> Before all the guests arrived, I had a little time to make a seasonal salad with spring lettuce, radishes, spring onions, sourdough croutons, and Parmesan cheese. I'm also preparing my favorite sauce to serve as steak. It's a verde sauce made with parsley, garlic, capers, lemon juice, and oil. I can't wait to taste the sauce on top of the meat and also on the salad as a dressing. Well, you guys, thank you so much for allowing me to spend time out here and letting me be able to cook for you. I, I just wanted to be able to say thank you and give back to you. So I hope y'all enjoy some skirt steak. So, cheers. Thank you for coming. We want these steaks to cook over really high heat, so I burn a big pile of wood down to a hot coal bed. To accompany the meat, I toss parboiled fingerling potatoes with tallow, or beef fat, and some rosemary sprigs in a cast iron skillet. Within minutes, they were crispy on the outside and tender in the middle. I also like to add a little brown sugar to thin pieces of meat that cook fast, like the skirt steak. It yields a really beautiful caramelization when seared over high heat. Last but not least, the most important thing to remember when working with a cut with a strong grain line is to slice it against the grain before serving. All right, everyone, come on over, make a plate. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking and eating with beef, humanely raised in collaboration with the surrounding ecosystem, has been an enlightening and educational experience. And knowing that this farmed meat is helping capture carbon and regenerate land that was severely depleted from decades of industrial agriculture has made me rethink what conscious eating really means. And a battle to protect the future of meat and sustainability it's important to support farmers like Will Harris. And after years of hunting for my own protein, I'm ready to purchase meat again and to advocate for regenerative ranching and small scale farming that prioritizes the health of our ecosystem and supports local communities.